Hey, so today will be the last day of new material. On Friday, I'll try to review the semester in a flurry as the last class. And then again, the, the final exam is a week from Saturday on the December 14th in the morning, 9 o'clock. Um, the last problem set's due on Friday at, at class time as well. Uh, I will also remind you that my special deal is if you complete the course evaluation, which is, last new it was up and, and still going, and it's got a firm deadline that's out of my control. I, um, if you complete the course evaluation, I drop your lowest problem set score, even if it's a zero. So for some of you who missed a problem set, that, you know, that's the get out of jail free card. Don't forget to, to submit it. Any other class logistical questions? I'll have my office hours as usually scheduled through, through the Wednesday before the exam. OK. Um, what I wanted to start out, off with was addressing a couple of questions that have come in that you all have sent me over the past two days or uh, two class periods or so, because they bring up interesting issues that, I, that, that, that um, are worth re re visiting. Uh, one of them asks about a straw. Is a straw, does a straw have one hole or two holes in effect? And what this brings to mind is, is the, I didn't really talk in class at least, about what is the, what is the oscillation like in a pipe? That is, when, when it's a, the column of air that, that, that's, that's housed and protected inside a pipe can oscillate as, it actually can oscillate in, in several modes, but, it, but its fundamental mode, for example, is its own harmonic oscillator. It, it has all the characteristics that you want from a harmonic oscillator. It's got a restoring force that is proportional to how far it's gone away from equilibrium. And therefore, the frequency of the oscillation doesn't depend on the amplitude of the oscillation. So, so let me look at a straw. The oscillation in a straw, because the straw protects the air inside it, the column of air inside it, the pressure and density inside the straw don't have to be atmospheric, at least momentarily. They're protected from the outside air. So you, the fundamental vibrational mode of a column of air in a straw, which is open at both ends, is the air rushing in from both ends toward the center and accumulating. So the, the pressure and density surge upward in the middle. And then, because that's high pressure and density, that's, uh, that's not at equilibrium. It's, it, it, it accelerates toward equilibrium, which is to have the air rush out of both ends. And it rushes out and accumulates momentum. And it keeps rushing out even past equilibrium, which is equilibrium being uniform pressure and density everywhere, air's favorite natural state. So then you end up with low density and pressure in the middle. So the, the, the column of air inside a straw sort of bounce back and forth between high pressure, high density, low pressure, low density, high pressure, high density, low pressure, high density, back and forth. That's the fundamental vibrational mode in a straw. All right? And the, the frequency of that is, is determined by the mass that's moving, the, that is the amount of inertia going on. So, so the mass of the air and the stiffness of the restoring effects. And that has to do with, with primarily the length of the pipe. And so if you make the pipe longer, the restoring forces get, get weaker. And also the mass goes up. So the, so, the, so the vibration frequency goes down. So long pipes have low frequencies. Short pipes have uh, high frequencies. And one interesting thing with the straw is if you, if you get the straw's air vibrating, which you can do by blowing across its, its upper lip and making it act as a whistle, it's, although it's never very, it doesn't give a nice clear tone, which always disappoints me, which is why I didn't go bother bringing a straw out. If it's open at both ends, you get that bouncing in the middle. But if you close one end with your finger and blow across it, the pitch goes down by one octave, which is an odd thing. And you can try it next time you got a drinking straw, which is soon, right? Unless you're like, don't use drinking straws. Cover the end, the pitch goes down by one octave. Why? Because once you close one end, it's now a straw that's open at one end. And so the air rushes in and out of that end, and it accumulates not in the middle anymore, but at, near your finger, the closed point. It's got a longer trip to follow. So it's now vibrating where the, 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 the peaks and valleys in pressure and density are at your finger, tw twice as far from that opening as before. You remove your finger. The, the bouncing peak, peak up and down in pressure is near your finger. 
When you close the straw, it's farther from your finger. And that makes the pipe effectively twice as long by, by some, in, in some respect. It's like a double length pipe, double length straw. So the pitch goes down because now you're, you're getting it to whistle in a, in a long straw instead of a short straw. Hope that's vaguely followable. Um, lots of wind instruments or equivalents of them around. And I, I mentioned last time the, 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 the just a, a car with, with a window cracked open. It's, it is a, uh, it's like the straw open at one end. The air can rush in and out of that one, one end and accumulate on the far side of the car to, to get rises and falls in pressure. So the experience of having someone crack a window in a car and getting a, a, a vibration going in the, in the air is that the person near the, the opening, near the open window, doesn't notice anything bad is going on because the air is moving back and forth in front of them, but that doesn't affect their ears much. The motion of the air is like being in a wind. The person at the far end of the car, however, is experiencing the, the rise in pressure density, the drop in pressure density, rise and drop, and that is irritating to your ears and other things. Okay, any, any other questions about vibrating air columns such as I'm talking about right now? Okay, next question that came in, that, that, that a particularly important one really, is what do I mean by resonance? What's a resonance? You know, I just use that word cavalierly. And what a resonance is, is when you have a system that has a stable equilibrium and can go through a cyclic motion about that stable equilibrium, a pendulum swinging back and forth, um, a, a stick vibrating up and down like that, um, lots of other possibilities, that, that rhythmic motion has a natural frequency associated with it. Um, and if it, it, these complicated extended objects can have more than one of these mo possible motions with a, with a specific frequency associated with it. Each of those is a resonance. Uh, and and that the motion ha has a resonant quality in that it, it has a well-defined frequency, equivalently well-defined period of motion, and it is particularly good then at, at accumulating energy, uh, saving energy and going rhythmically through that motion at that frequency. So how to pin this down. So a pendulum has a resonance at that one special frequency. It, it's, this pendulum's got, it's about a four and a half second period, so its frequency is about uh, 0.2 something cycles per second. It, it is, so you would say that's, it is, it is a reson, yeah, resonator. It has a resonance at 0.2 cycles per second. If it encounters stuff, going, stuff happening around it at 0.2 cycles per second, it is very likely to start moving itself, having, ha, having extracted energy from the other things um, that, are, that are influencing it at its favorite or resonant frequency. What are examples of resonances then? So, so, so long and short of it is, lots of things in our world are harmonic oscillators. Uh, I hope you've started to see that. A diving board is a harmonic oscillator. A tree, can I, can I get it going? I can't get the tree going. You know, a tree, boing, is a harmonic oscillator. Uh, tuning fork, obviously, but you know, that's totally human made. Um, a swinging, your bird feeder swing on a rope back and forth, a pendulum, it's a harmonic oscillator, but just like they're, they're all over the place. And if they're exposed to, to motion at the frequency of their natural behavior, their, their, their natural resonance, their natural uh, cyclic motion frequency, they tend to get going with it. They extract energy from it and go with it. Is that, is that okay for, so far? So, examples of resonances, okay, these are somewhat artificial. I showed you this one last time, but let me play with it a little more. These two tuning forks have the same natural resonance. They're, they're, they're tuned to the same frequency, which happens to be, oh, it says in here, but I can't read it anymore. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay, so they have the same natural frequency. Therefore, if I get one of them going, and expose the other one to the sound of the, of the first one going, they will transfer their energy from one to the other 
because this one and that one have the same resonance. They, they, they undergo what, what's called sympathetic vibration. So I can get this one going and let it talk to that one for a little while. And now this one's going. So it is, I mean, the, the, the word resonant gets used, or resonance resonator, they get used in so many different ways that I can't pin down, you know, give you a succinct dictionary definition that, that sounds perfect. Um, but you can say that these tuning forks, ha they have a resonance. It is that, it, you hear the resonance, you hear the frequency of that resonance as part of you know, how we perceive sound and music. And if I spoil the match between these two things, and I can do that pretty easily by, by sticking putty on one of the, t well, I, one of the tines. I'm, I stuck putty on it. That doesn't change the stiffness of the spring, but it increases the inertia. So what's it gonna ha what effect is it going to have on the, on the frequency, the number of cycles it makes per second? You tell me. Up or down? Down. We're going to slow it down, more inertia. It's harder to bring that time back. So now instead of being this pitch, it's this pitch. You barely can hear. It's a little lower in pitch. And the result of that is this, that they won't transfer energy well anymore. Let me get it really going. Nothing. No transfer at all. So the transfers are really only work when the two things have the same, the same natural rhythm, the same resonance. Okay, so far. Um, I told you last time. And actually, I, okay, I'll, I'll bring resonance up again in a second in, uh, in response to another question that came in, and that is, is why does a phone speaker, why is a phone speaker louder when it's inside a cup? So you probably noticed that, that where you put your little phone, you know, put it in certain things in, and, and, and the, the volume goes up. And that, the reason for that is it's, it's hard to launch sound. I told you that strings are terrible at doing it. Strings going back and forth, um, just the air just scoots around them and it's very hard, to, that string does not then compress the air or uncompress it. And that's what you need to launch sound. You actually want to get the air packed tightly and unpacked and packed and unpacked. And strings don't do it well. Uh, what does do it well? Well, a surface does. And I, I, I brought this up last time but didn't really follow the whole thing through, but why the surface works. The surface then, if the surface moves toward you, away from you, the air gets pushed, it gets squeezed in front of it as it comes, the air here, gets squeezed as the, as the surface comes toward it and unsqueezed as the surface goes back. Although there is a tendency for the air as it gets pushed forward to scoot out from the, in front of the surface and try to go behind it, right? So if, if I'm trying to move, pick a random surface, can I find one? A sheet of paper. So I'm trying to move a surface toward you away from the air to some extent goes around it and, and goes in behind it. And that's not effective at launching sound. So, so what do you do? You, you try to, to baffle the surface so the air can't scoot around the surface. And so lots of speakers and musical instruments and such try to, they, they want to have the surface move and they also want to protect the back of the surface so that the air can't simply go around it. Uh, the amount of time that air has to go around the surface if it's not properly baffled on the back depends on how fast, how the frequency of, of the, the surface's motion. If the, if the surface's motion is very fast, there's no time for the air to go around. So, so you can make little speakers that emit high pitches that are physically little. You, the air just doesn't have time to get around the back. But if you're trying to launch low, fre low, low frequency sound, woo, 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 the air's got plenty of time to scoot around the back of the speaker, so you have to be very careful about protecting the back. So you, those of you, you all have sound systems of some sort or other. You can think about the, the issues in, that, that audio engineers have to go through in trying to make sure that it properly launches the sound. It just doesn't move back and forth and let the air go around it. Okay? It's a feel that you know, some of these, I don't understand it very well. I mean, finally, all the details, how you get it to work, how you get a speaker to work really well. Speakers 50 years ago 
uh, speaker systems were huge and they now have made very effective speakers that are much, much smaller and how they've pulled that off is, is, is amazing to me. All right, another probably final demonstration of the, of the problem of, of launching sound. I told you also that, that tuning forks aren't very good at launching sound. Same problem, the air scoots around, the, the, the tines are going like this and the air just goes around them, back and forth. So this is not very loud. But if I, if I use this, I transfer energy from this to a, a spherical portion of air that's trapped inside this, this ball. It's, it, it, it's not a column of air anymore. It's a sphere of air with, a, with holes at the, uh, both ends. This is a spherical resonator. It has a sharp resonance. And they're at the, at the same frequency. This is 128 cycles per second. And this has a resonance at 128 cycles per second. So does the air inside this, what's called a Helmholtz Holtz re resonator. And once I get the air bouncing back and forth, that's a pretty good radiator, radiator of sound. So wind instruments pretty naturally send the sound out into the air. Although getting the sound uh, to leave the instrument is, is, is a little tricky, getting it out into the open air, so that's why some instruments have bells at the end. They, they taper to go out into the air to let the sound out in effect. So now, can you hear it back there? Nothing? So that's a, a, that's a low frequency resonator. It's big. Why big? The restoring forces are relatively weak in this spread out environment. And the, and the mass is big, a lot of air. A lot of mass of air. I can work my way up. I don't, I don't want to touch the physical resonator because it's not the brass that's vibrating. It's the air that's vibrating. Okay. All right. Um, the last question deals with reflection and refraction, and I will see whether I can manage to get to that today in talking about waves. So, so I, I'm going to leave musical instruments. Last, last thoughts about it. I showed you that, that a taut string has, a taut string uh, behaves as, as various harmonic oscillators. It has its fundamental vibrational mode, which is the single arc. It can vibrate as two half strings at twice the frequency. That's a second harmonic. Uh, it can vibrate as three one-third strings. That's the third harmonic, and so on. Um, stringed instruments, therefore, have a, a, behave as a couple of different harmonic oscillators. The fact that they're harmonic oscillators is very important. Remember, harmonic oscillators mean the restoring forces are proportional to displacement. And the, the key feature of harmonic oscillator is that the frequency doesn't depend on amplitude of, of motion. That's important for most, I would say, conventional music. It means that whether you play loud or soft on a guitar or violin or cello, a harp, you get the same pitch out of the note. The pitch is determined not by how loud the sound is, but by the mass of the string, the tension in the string, and the length of the string, right? So we're used to that. Musical instruments, you can play a quiet piece on a piano, and then you can play a loud piece on the piano. You get the same pitches. That's good. Uh, there are some instruments that have a swoop to the pitch. At, at large amplitudes, they're not quite the same pitch. So they, they, they're twangy. It's the, the pitch goes from loud, it either goes up or down, and, uh, as, as the volume decreases. Um, wind instruments, again, harmonic oscillators. Uh, and the pitches don't depend on how loud you play them. Almost, they're almost perfectly independent of how loud you play them. Last thing I should say about musical instruments, they're almost all based on one-dimensional extended objects. A string has one important dimension to it, left to right. A column of air in a, in a Organ pipe 
one dimension, top to bottom. There are instruments, however, ah, and a feature you get from that is that the fundamental vibrational modes and the harmonic and, and the other modes in which the, 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 the extended object can vibrate tend to be related by integer values of frequency. So the second harmonic is twice the frequency, third harmonic three times the frequency, and fourth. And that sounds musical to our ears. There are not a lot of, of random frequencies present in the sound coming out of a guitar or a violin or an organ. Surfaces that are uh, objects that are extended objects that are two-dimensional, like the, the head of a drum, don't follow this rule. A head of a drum is, can act as, as a number of different harmonic oscillators. It can have the middle going up and down. Um, it can have the left, the one side going down, the other side going up. It can do these circular symmetric motions that are, that are part of its modes. Um, it can, it, the point is it, it does have several harmonic oscillator ways in which it can vibrate, and they individually have frequencies that don't depend on their amplitudes of motion, but they're poorly related to each other. It, they are not factors of, of one or two or three or four or five in frequency. They're not harmonics. They're all messy, and that's because you can't divide a drum head into two half drum heads. What are you going to do? You're going to go slice it in the middle, and now you've got a, a you know, D-shaped part and another D-shaped part. It's not two little circles anymore. And so the result is that drums and cymbals and other two-dimensional oscillating extended objects, they are not so simply musical as we're, as we're used to. They, they're not, the, the sound is, is more complicated and, and uh, clashing and dissonant. OK? That, I think, I've done justice to, to musical instruments. Any other questions about musical instruments? All right, so the sea and, and uh, waves and things like that. Actually, it's, it's, it, in, to, to some extent, it's an excuse for talking about waves. The, the surface of, of any large body of water easily, and in fact, almost always has motions on it, ripples on it, something traveling along it. And those some things are, are waves or equivalents to waves. And so I could talk a little about waves. Uh, what waves turn out to be is their motions about an equilibrium again, very much like the motions of a string about equilibrium or the air in a pipe around equilibrium. But the difference is in a string and a, and a pipe, the extended object, a taut string, the column of air, is finite. It ends. It's limited. On a, on, on a large body of water, if it's, you know, if it's, if it's larger than this, it sort of doesn't have an end anymore. It kind of goes off for a long time, and you can, you can at least pretend that it, that, it, that it is endless. In which case, it still has these harmonic oscillator motions to it. Uh, typically, they're harmonic oscillators. But they are now a different sort of kettle of fish. They, they involve motions that where, where the whole, the whole uh, oscillation moves across uh, along the, 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 the now infinitely extended object. And so I can, just, just to get you in, in, in the mood or here, where I, we can look at, at, at those motions. This, this spring here isn't infinite. It's pretty long. It's long enough that I can start showing you waves on it. And I'm going to launch a wave here and send it off to the right. And, and to the, before it hits the far end, it's, it, it, it thinks it's on an infinite surface. So off it goes. You can see it. And once it hits the end, something, something weird happens. It, it reflects. It actually reflects upside down. And that's that reflection. So, so first of all, this is what's known as a transverse wave. I, I said a little bit about this on Monday. It's a wave that is moving horizontally, but it involves the local mo motion being vertical. That is at right angles to the actual travel of the wave. So the wave travels horizontally, but the intrinsic motion that, that makes up the wave is vertical. And so the name for that is transverse. That is as opposed to what? And, 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 tr and transverse waves are, are the, the character of, of waves on water. They are transverse waves. Um, 
Sound is a longitudinal wave. I showed you this little gadget last time. The, the wave travels, these are little magnets that repel each other. And the wave, in that case, the wave is traveling horizontally. And, and the intrinsic motion that, that uh, constitutes the wave is also horizontal, in the same direction as the motion. So that's called the longitudinal wave. The other is called the transverse. This is another example of a, of a longitudinal wave. So I can, I can send it along the slinky, and it, it travels. The, 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 in, the underlying motion is, is le horizontal left right, and the wave is moving horizontal left right. All of these, I'll show you one more, okay? This is another transverse wave gadget. You know, while the wave is on the, hasn't yet figured out that it's actually on a limited system, it, it thinks it's in, on an infinite one. It's, it's one of these nice traveling ripples. That one just is particularly pretty. When it gets to the end, it suddenly realizes, uh-oh, not on an infinite system, and it reflects, which is itself an interesting problem. Um, w at this point, though, let me ask you a simple question. And i got to remember, do this right. All right. So here's a, assuming that the camera's on, it is. So, I mean, really, really the, the, the topic is supposed to be the ocean, water on, or, or a lake, the water on, on the surface of, a, of the sea. And hopefully many of you have been in, you know, or all of you, have, have, have been out in, in the waves and you've watched the waves go by and we haven't really pinned down exactly what constitutes a wave as opposed to the ripples and whatever. But in any case, you're there in the waves and they're heading towards shore and they're, uh, and you're, you're floating on this water and you're not getting hit by the water as, as it's breaking into whatever. What's your motion like? Are you heading towards shore with the wave or not? You okay with the question? Let me start this and see what you think. And it may well not be something you thought much about. So go to 30 seconds and see what. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. It is C. You do move in a circle. And you can you drift shoreward a little bit uh, for, for other reasons and probably because the wind is blowing along with the waves. But your actual motion, you're really not, you're not making much progress. And so, so junk on the surface of, the, of the, uh, the sea with the waves going by, the junk just kind of sits there and travels in a circle. It doesn't really go very fast. It doesn't go with the waves. You have to work at it to actually ride the waves. So those of you who have done surfing, which I haven't, um, when you, once you get out past the, where the waves are breaking, you're kind of bobbing up and down until you deliberately make yourself go with the wave and then begin to ride down it like a ramp, like a ramp that, that is itself rising up beneath you. And the point of asking that question then is to say that the basically all waves involve a rhythmic local motion of something. And that the something doesn't make any progress. It just goes through the local motion. But it's the disturbance that causes that motion. It's the disturbance that moves. So in the case of, of my waves with a spring, the spring isn't, make, isn't going to make any overall progress. This chunk of spring right here is not going to go off to the right at, end of this, uh, is not going to hit that post. It's going to stay mostly put, but it, it goes through a local motion, and the way, I, I've got it now going so fast, you can't see what's going on. I, sh I should point out, as, I as I'm playing with the tension here, I'm changing the speed at which the wave moves. 
because I'm stiffening the restoring forces. When I pull it taut, I stiffen the restoring forces and reduce the mass locally. And so everything goes through its motion faster. And the, the wave travels faster. See how fast it's going back and forth? If I loosen the spring, there's, first of all, there's a little more mass. And second off, all the restoring forces are weaker. So the travel is slower. OK? So the speed of sound actually is not an absolute constant in nature. It varies according to the, the, the details of the air. Um, the mass presence, the restoring force. I, I showed you uh, last time with helium. If you replace all the air in this room with helium, and before everyone passed out, sound would travel really fast because helium is so low in mass, it, it goes through its motions really fast. OK, um, so the, the, the point is that, that waves, the, the, the water in a water wave doesn't really move from here to there. It goes through a cycle and comes back to where it started as the waves go by. All right? Before doing more about the waves, let me, let me talk about the other pieces that I put into that, the, the, the sea and the ocean uh, section. The first of which is, is the tides. You should have some sense of why the tides exist. So for those of you who don't know what the tides are, you go to the, you go to the uh, Virginia Beach, so you're somewhere on the eastern shore of Virginia, and you watch the average water level. You know, get, don't worry about the waves. Just watch the, the average height of the water. It goes up and down cyclically. About every 12 hours, it's, it's high, and it, it's at its highest, and every 12 hour, hours alternately, it's at its lowest. It's, so it's going up and down twice a day. Now, where does that come from? Where does that behavior come from? And it comes from primarily the moon's gravity. It's one of the few ways in which we know the moon has gravity. We can sense the moon has gravity. The moon's so far away. I mean, the moon's big, not as big as the Earth, but it's so far away that it is exerting gravitational forces on you right, right now, but you barely notice them. Uh, one of the few things that does notice them is the Earth's oceans. And that comes about for a, a non-trivial reason. The Earth is essentially in free fall towards the moon as the moon is in free fall toward the Earth. They're orbiting one another. And I told you with, with the context of orbits, you know, what, what does it mean for, for an astronaut to orbit the Earth? The astronaut is in free fall toward the Earth and therefore feels no weight. And if I didn't tell you this semester, the astronauts are perpetually feeling just like you riding a drop tower. You, that that ah feeling of, of falling is what they're feeling 24-7, which is why something more than half of them or other have, have motion sickness. And they don't show you videos of that very much. But, but it, it, is, it is sickening uh, for many of them. So they're in free fall. And the only reason they don't crash into the Earth is because they're going sideways so fast they miss it and go round and round. The Earth and the Moon are in the same boat. They are falling towards one another by, by virtue of their own gravity. They're pulling equally hard on each other in opposite directions, Newton's third law. And they would go smack if it weren't for the fact that they're heading sideways. So they go around each other. And actually, they go around a, 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 their, total, their combined center of mass is what they're circling. So they're in free fall. And the Earth, to the extent that it is a solid object, uh, all travels together in this free fall business. Even though the moon's gravity is a little stronger on the side of the Earth close to the moon than it is on the side of the Earth farthest from the moon. Your, the moon's gravity varies with distance, like everything else. I, I, initially, I told you gravity is, is here at the Earth's surface is always the same. And then later on, I told you, eh, that's not quite right. It does actually vary with distance. And it gets weaker with distance. So the moon's gravity on the Earth gets weaker with distance. And the Earth being essentially solid doesn't, doesn't uh, respond to the difference. But its oceans do. So the Earth as a whole falls towards the moon at a certain acceleration due to gravity. But the water nearest the moon falls a little faster, or tries to. It's, it's experiencing stronger gravity. So it bulges out. It doesn't actually leave the Earth um, for various reasons. It, it stays attached to the Earth, but it's bulged. And the water farthest from the moon, which is experiencing the weakest gravity, would, is, 
would essentially get left behind if it could, because it's not falling, it's, it's got a smaller acceleration to gravity, but it doesn't actually leave the Earth either, it just bulges out there too. So if you all are the moon and I'm the Earth, there's a bulge toward you in the, in the water, and there's a bulge behind you. And as the Earth turns, which it does, it c completes one full revolution about once per day. There, and you have this, now you've got to deal with one full revolution with respect to what? With respect to facing the moon each time, but the moon's moving. It's messy. There's a sidereal day, and there's the calendar day. It's a, I'm just going to sweep it all under the rug and say about every 24 hours, the Earth turns once, and so my nose goes from it's in the bulge to not in the bulge to in a, the other bulge to not in the bulge and back. And so this is high tide, low tide. High tide, low tide, high tide. So the water, as the earth turns, Virginia Beach has, is, is in the bulge twice a day and it's in the, it's in the non-bulge twice a day. Is that okay with everybody? This is, so, so that's the origin of the tides, is those two bulges. They're strongest essentially near the equator. On the, on the poles, they're really not going in and out of the bulges at all. So there are kind of no, no tides there. So the tides are, are, are strongest near the, near the, 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 the waist of the earth, the, the equator of the earth. What else about them? Um, they're modulated a bit by the sun, too. The sun's gravity, you know, amazingly enough, oh, amazingly enough, the sun's very far away from us. And so the, 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 the difference between its gravity on the near side of the Earth and the far side of the Earth would seemingly be very small. But because the sun is so big and so much mass, it still has an effect. And so it introduces its own bulges. They're only about a third as big as the moon's bulges. But when the sun's bulges and the moon's bulges are simultaneously uh, overlapped, you get especially strong tides, what are called spring tides. And when they're at right angles to each other, the sun's bulges and the moon's bulges are at right angles, you get weak tides, neap tides. Okay, so, this is, so this is the origin of the, of the, the two high tides a day, two low tides a day, and why they're stronger and weaker uh, over the course of a month, depending on where the, where the moon is relative to the sun, overhead or not overhead. All right? Next thing to deal with the, the, in, in looking at, at, at uh, the sea and stuff is the tides, that, that description of the tides isn't quite the whole story, there are some places where the tides are quite weak and some places where the tides are strikingly strong, or amazingly strong. And this has to do with resonances. Uh, in part, it's resonance, res resonances. The other thing I would say is that in small bodies of water, a lake, you can't have much of a tide because to really make the tide work right, you need to, you need to be able to draw water to your lake from, from the other uh, a quarter of the way around the earth. Well, the lake is isolated. The water can't go in there and come out. So the, so the lake has to work with the water it has in responding to the moon's gravity. And it can build up a little bit at one end and a little bit at the other, but not enough to make significant tides. So little bodies of water develop tiny tides, insignificant tides. So that's, so really minimal tides is, a, is, is true for kind of a boring reason. Giant tides is, is are present in some places for an interesting reason, having to do with resonance. Water in, you know, water can do these harmonic oscillator motions. And if you take water in a finite channel, so, so I, I, I show you, I've talked about air in a, in a, in a pipe. It can, it can have harmonic oscillator modes. Uh, a string, obviously. How about water in a, in a, a left to right channel? One, it's another one-dimensional system. It can have harmonic oscillator modes. And so here I've got water in a channel, and I can get the sloshing going. And I'm doing it, I, get, I, get to be in, in, I have to figure out what its frequency is. And 
you all have tried this in basins and bathtubs and stuff, right? You get the water going, and it's, this is its fundamental mode of, of uh, oscillation. It's another harmonic oscillator. And I'm putting the water in by doing work rhythmically once per cycle, but I have to, I, having to identify the, the, the cycle. It's about, it's about that, right? If I go twice as fast, I could probably get, I could probably get wet. But I, but I probably can get one of the harmonic modes. It's going to have harmonic modes, the whole thing. All right? The point is, the more mass I'm, I'm dealing with, and the longer the channel is to, to, to lessen the, the, the tilt, the slope as I slosh, the lower the frequency gets. So here, the, here the, the, the resonant, the fundamental vibrational mode is something like once a second. Yeah, it's about once a second. If I made this thing much longer, it would be once every minute. And if I made it really long, but not too long, it would be once every 12 hours. Well, that would be an interesting number, because that means that it sloshes at the same rate at which the high and low tides go through their cycle. And so energy can transfer from the tides into the sloshing motion. And there are places, I mean, the most famous of which is the Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia, which is just the right length and behavior. It's got a resonance right there timed with the tides. And the tides are perpetually sloshing the water back and forth. And so they go up and down you know, 50 or 80 feet or something like that. They're just horrendous tides there. It's, it, the, the energy in that slosh has been built up over the course of uh, weeks. And it accumulated. It's like pushing a kid on a swing. A little push, a little push, a little push. Uh, there are periodically efforts to tap the energy out of these giant tides. But in doing that, the people involved have to remember, the energy is going in over many cycles. So don't take it out in a single cycle. You, 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 it's like trying to tap the energy out of the kid who's been swinging. Yeah, they're being pushed a little each swing, but you don't want to take all the energy out in one swing. You got to be gentle, you know, conservative in taking the energy out. Uh, it's been accumulated by virtue of a natural resonance. All right. Okay. Uh, with water wa waves on the surface of the water, they again, it's a, it's a water has a, an equilibrium arrangement, flat. The water surface being flat. Set aside the moon now. Just, if gravity had its druthers, the water surface would be flat. Water seeking its level. Remember back to dealing with water. If you've got a high point, that's got extra potential energy. It can release that potential energy by filling in a low point. So you want to go to flat. So that's equilibrium. If you pull it away from equilibrium, it will tend to accelerate back toward the equilibrium, build up momentum, and overshoot. And then accelerate back toward equilibrium, and go back and overshoot and back and forth and back and forth. So you get, you'll get oscillations about the equilibrium. And you can get structured oscillations about equilibrium um, that are waves. Uh, these waves, the, the restoring force on these waves has to do with gravity. If you turn off gravity, water doesn't care about being flat anymore. So these are called gravity waves. And they are surf, on the surface of the, of the ocean or the, or the lake. So they're called water surface, you know, water surface gravity waves. And the actual motion of the waves, let me see what I've got. Did I bring the picture here? I think this guy should work. Let me, oh, it's over here. I want it. Yeah, it's going. Okay, let me put this up here. Th this the, the water surface waves, in this case, obviously the waves are going to the right. The local water, however, is going through a cyclic motion where it's located. It's not actually making any progress anywhere. It's going around in a circle. And so I, I made this a zillion years ago uh, and tried to get it in time. It also has a, that, that swoop through the bottom is real. It, it has to do with the energy is going from gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy, the gravitational potential energy, to kinetic energy. But that, the, so the local motion is these circles. And the wave, however, moves along. 
some interesting observations about the waves of the water surface gravity waves are that for once, these waves don't move at a speed that's independent of their frequency. Sound waves, I should, I should preface this, sound waves have the wonderful behavior that the speed at which the sound waves travel doesn't depend on their frequency, which means that if the whole orchestra, from the highest pitch piccolos, whatever, to the lowest pitch tubas, if everybody plays a note, boom, at once, people off in the far end of the bleachers or whatever, uh, they all hear the, all the sounds arrive at once. Because the, the speed at which those different frequencies of, of, of disturbance in the air travel is independent of the frequency. Water waves don't do that. Uh, water waves, the speed at which the water wave moves, if you follow a crest, for example, depends on, in effect, the frequency of the wave. And the lower the frequency of the wave, actually, the faster it moves. And this is why it's the low frequency, the very high, fre the very high frequency waves, which, which incidentally have short distances between crests, they, they, they go along slowly on the, on the water. The normal frequency ones, the, the, the big, big breakers that you're used to, they travel at a pretty decent clip, you know, the walk, a ru walking, running speed. But the, but the waves with very low frequencies and very long distances between their crests, such as tsunamis, travel very fast. They travel hundreds of miles an hour. Um, and so that's how these, those waves, which, which typically are, are triggered by earthquakes or something equivalent, they can travel across an entire ocean and arrive at the other place in, in, in a few hours. They're going like crazy. Um, so water surface, water gravity surface waves uh, travel at different speeds depending on their, their frequencies. Last thing worth talking about here, or that I, can, that I got time in, whatever to talk about, is when these waves approach shore, the, these ripples, so they're, again, they're, they're, they're the, the cyclic motions that cause this disturbance that travels. When those waves in, approach the shore, they start running out of water to make their circle motion. The circle motion extends not for all the way to the, to the bottom of the, of, the, of the ocean always, but, but a few, a few uh, in, in the range of the distance between those, those crests that you see there, what's called the wavelength of the wave. So the water is moving in this motion for about, that's the same distance is from the bottle to this other lip, so down. If you go down below that, the water's not moving very much. So fish tend to hang out below that, so they don't sit, so the fish aren't doing the circle motion all day. When you get near the shore, you run out of water to do the circle motion. And if it, run, if it runs out of water, if the wave runs out of water gradually, the circle motion just sort of gradually decays and you get, cr the waves crumble and become kind of just white water and drift up toward the beach. If the waves run out of, uh, out of water, if, Suddenly, that is the shore abruptly, uh, the, the ocean bottom or the sea bottom abruptly rises. The wave runs out of water to make this to do the local circle motion very suddenly, and the back end of the wave stays of, of a crest continues to head forward. But there's no water to make the front end of the crest, so the so the wave breaks. So you get these the, the familiar wave where there's this diving back half wave and nothing in front of it. It didn't have water to make that piece. And so you get the diving surf, uh, popular with, with, at least with some surfers. Okay? Last, last thing I can talk about, which is the, one of the questions that came in. Um, yeah, I can't do this. Some of the questions are, are too, too complicated for the moment. Reflections and refractions. When, when waves, instead of just coming into the, to the shore and, and crashing a surf, if they hit a, like a seawall, it's the same as, the, 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 mathematically, it's very much like, like I'm going to launch a wave and it's going to hit a seawall, which is that post, and watch what happens. You get a reflection. So waves, when they hit the end of, a, a, of their extended object and encounter a completely different object that sort of won't move, they reflect. Um, the, better, the, the more immovable that object is, the better the reflection. And this is the whole concept, not only behind 
uh, wa waves hitting seawalls and bouncing, and you can watch them go, you can watch them go backwards. There is also echoes, like, like you all have encountered echoes. The, 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 the new dorms, for example, you go there and you clap your hands, you hear the sound bouncing off all the walls. You're launching sound waves, off they go, and they hit the wall, and they can't get into the wall well, and they bounce. Uh, it's the same reflection. So you get reflections off surfaces. You also get bending, and just to do that with, you know, why are the waves always coming towards shore? Why aren't they hitting it at sharp angles? And that comes about because as the wave approaches the shore and runs out of water, it's, it slows down. And so a wave that's going to, that's going to, here's the shore, and I'm a wave heading along. I, my, my, my left hand is, is encountering the shore too soon. It slows down, and my, the whole wave steers, and it heads more towards shore. So there's, that's an effect known as refraction. It's more familiar with, with light and glass and prisms and things, but it's also present in water waves. They tend to, to, to bend and, and approach the shore more, more sharp, more directly because of that slowing effect near the shore. All right, I'll stop. Thank you for sticking around, and we'll uh, go on. <laughs>